George Blake was the embodiment of the quintessential British gentleman. Charismatic, intelligent and radiating charm, he was to MI6 the very model of an intelligence officer. However, beneath this polished exterior lay a mastermind of deception. Enthralled by the promise of a communist utopia and disillusioned by NATO military tactics during the Korean War, Blake turned his back on his homeland, betraying national secrets and fellow agents to the Soviets during the tense 1950s era of the Cold War. Unlike many of those whom he betrayed, Blake went on to enjoy a long life in Moscow, courtesy of the Kremlin. With decades to ponder his life's choices, he harbored no regrets. To the very end, he remained a contented spy, his conscience unburdened, believing that in the world of espionage, no one is truly innocent. This is the story of George Blake, Britain's greatest traitor. Born on the 11th of November 1922 in Rotterdam, George's birthplace was a melting pot of cultures and ideas, perhaps foreshadowing his complex beliefs and ideals. His family name was originally Behar. His father, Albert, was born in Egypt and was of Jewish descent. George grew up enjoying the tales told by his father of his service in the French Foreign Legion and the British Army during World War I. Albert was injured during the war, having deep facial scars from flying shrapnel and damaged lungs following a gas attack. Shortly after the war, Albert was posted to Rotterdam, where he settled and met George's mother, Catherine. She was Dutch, upper middle class, and a remonstrant Protestant. At some point, perhaps through his military service, Albert was granted a British passport, as a result of which young George was born a British citizen. George had two younger sisters, Adele and Elizabeth. For most of their early years, the family lived comfortably among bourgeois, conservative circles in the Netherlands. Idolizing the Dutch royal family, George became a Calvinist and intended to become a pastor in the Dutch Reformed Church. The Baha family saw their fortunes dashed when Albert's business was affected like so many others by the 1929 Wall Street crash. George was only 13 when, in 1936, his father passed away after finally succumbing to his wartime injuries. George was shocked to learn of his Jewish heritage upon his father's death, a fact which Albert had kept secret. This loss, combined with the ongoing economic hardships of the 1930s, caused young George to be relocated to live with his wealthy aunt Zafira in Egypt. In this new environment, he pursued his education at the English school in Cairo. It was also here that George began to assemble the beginnings of his ideological worldview. He grew close to his cousin, Henry Curiel, an extroverted womanizer and a fervent Marxist. Curiel went on to spearhead the communist democratic movement for national liberation in Egypt. Henri was repeatedly arrested and imprisoned and would eventually be assassinated by right-wing extremists in Paris. Their interactions were profound, with George admitting in 1991 that Curiel's influence played a pivotal role in shaping his political beliefs. Despite this, George returned to Holland still influenced by his mother's strong Protestant faith and his ambition to enter the church. When the Second World War broke out, George was back in the Netherlands on a summer visit. He endured Nazi Germany's Blitzkrieg in May 1940 of Rotterdam, cycling away from the decimated old city to The Hague where his mother and sisters were living. Upon arrival, he found that they had already fled to England. As the German war machine marched across Western Europe, George refused to leave his home nation, choosing instead to join the Dutch resistance as a courier. He was motivated by a multitude of factors, his pro-British sentiments and citizenship, his half-Jewish background, and the brutal occupation of his Dutch homeland. Despite being apprehended by the Germans, his youth played to his advantage, and he was released, given he was only 17. For nearly two years after that, he dodged German patrols to deliver underground papers and intelligence on German army positions to the Allies. After he turned 18, George felt that he had more to offer the war effort than merely running messages across occupied Netherlands. He was at the time living with a family in the southern Dutch village of Zundert. Together with the two daughters of the household, he planned to make his escape and ultimately rejoin his family in England. The first leg of his journey involved the crossing of the Dutch border into Belgium. 
The three were confronted by a soldier a mere 100 yards from the border, but fortunately the daughters knew the Austro-German soldier from attendance at the local Catholic church. He was waved through the border and into Belgium. He continued his harrowing journey through occupied France and into Spain. There he was interred for three months until Spanish dictator Franco chose to reinstate Spanish neutrality. Upon his release, George pressed on to Gibraltar and finally reached London by January 1943. Upon his arrival in England, he was briefly detained for security investigation at the Royal Victoria Patriotic School in Wandsworth, South London. After passing the necessary checks, George was finally reunited with his mother and sisters. In a bid to start anew, they anglicised their surname by changing it from Behar to Blake. Determined to continue the fight against the Nazis, he joined the Royal Navy. He learned of a branch of the Navy called the Special Service, which he promptly signed up for. Much to his disappointment, this did not involve spying or espionage, but rather the operation of two-man mini-submarines. Initially posted to the submarine branch, he was found unfit for the role due to his propensity to pass out when underwater. However, his fluency in Dutch and German and his time serving in the resistance caught the attention of the SIS. Soon after, in 1944, an SIS headhunter recruited George Blake, giving him his first taste of covert activity with the Special Operations Executive. He was initially disappointed not to be sent to Holland. Instead, as part of the SOE's Dutch section, he supported resistance movements in Europe by training agents who were sent to the Netherlands and worked on decoding the material they sent back. Having developed a solid reputation among his peers, he was soon identified for promotion by his superiors. In September 1945, MI6 dispatched him to Hamburg for his first taste of operations in the field. In the aftermath of the war, Blake found himself working for the Naval Intelligence Unit. His duties mostly included interrogating former German U-boat commanders to establish whether the men were founding an underground Nazi resistance movement. He was also tasked with spying on Soviet forces, and he quickly realised that former German officers, many of whom were in dire financial straits, were willing to use their extensive contacts in East Germany to work on building a local intelligence network. The mission was a resounding success, with Blake playing a pivotal role in establishing a network of agents right in the heart of East Germany. This success, combined with Blake's talent for languages, resulted in him being sent by MI6 to Cambridge University after his return to Britain. In the face of the ever-growing threat of communism from the Soviet Union, George Blake was tasked with deepening his understanding of the Russian language. Cambridge was not just an academic hub, it was a fertile ground for recruiting both MI6 agents and, as history would later reveal, double agents for the KGB. Here, George was lectured by an English professor whose mother was Russian. She didn't preach communism, but had a deep-rooted love for Russian culture and the Orthodox Church. Under her tutelage, George found himself increasingly drawn to Russia. This growing fascination was more than just academic curiosity. It was the first sign of a shift in George's ideological compass. While not yet a communist, the seeds were sown, and his next assignment would be the catalyst for a switching of allegiances. On November 6, 1948, George Blake was dispatched to the British legation in Seoul, South Korea. While his official title was that of Vice Consul, his true mission was far more covert. Blake was tasked with gathering intelligence on the communist activities in North Korea, China and the Soviet Far East. Korea became a battleground of ideologies after its division along the 38th parallel in 1948. The Soviet Union backed the North, while the United States supported an aggressively anti-communist regime in the South. George Blake was sent into this perilous environment armed with little more than his wits and diplomatic cover. His mission to establish an agent network in North Korea proved largely futile, and over time he grew increasingly disillusioned with America's puppet administration in Seoul, which he came to view as fascist. The geopolitical landscape then shifted dramatically on June 25, 1950, when the Korean War erupted. In a swift and unexpected move, the Korean People's Army from the north overran Seoul. As British forces rallied to the defense of the south under the banner of the United Nations Command, 
Blake, along with his fellow British diplomats, were taken prisoner by North Korean forces. As the war's momentum shifted, the prisoners were moved further north, journeying through Pyongyang and eventually to the Yalu River. It was during this period that he witnessed the devastating bombings of North Korea. The scale of the destruction inflicted by the U.S. Air Force by their B-17 flying fortresses was of a scale surpassing anything Blake had seen before, and it filled him with shame. While imprisoned, he immersed himself in the writings of Karl Marx and Vladimir Lenin, books that had been sent to the North Korean prison camp by a nearby office of the German Stasi. Blake's profound ideological transformation was starting to reach its zenith. He'd become convinced that the triumph of communism would herald a more peaceful era for humanity, juxtaposed against the materialist and imperialist convictions of the USA. He embraced communism, and in so doing, found his allegiance to the West wavering. In the autumn of 1951, Blake took a decisive step. He handed his captors a note written in Russian, addressed to the Soviet embassy, indicating he had important information to share. While Blake never revealed the full details of his recruitment into the KGB, what is known is that he started meeting with a young KGB officer named Nikolai Loenko, who was sent to the camp to recruit prospective Western spies among the prisoners. To test his bona fides, Blake was told to write down everything he knew about the structure of the SIS. This he promptly did, and when it was compared against the information British double agent Kim Philby had already provided the KGB, it was a dead match. With this, George Blake's recruitment as a double agent for the KGB was complete. Joseph Stalin died on March 5, 1953. With the appointment of Nikita Khrushchev as the Soviet Union's new premier, tensions between East and West began to ease. Arrangements were soon made for Blake and his fellow prisoners to be released in a prisoner exchange. Upon his return to England on April 22, 1953, Blake was set to rise through the ranks of MI6, but all the while played a dangerous double game. To the world, he was a loyal British intelligence officer and a heroic former prisoner of war. Yet in truth, he was the KGB's most promising agent in place within British intelligence. George Blake, codenamed Diamid, was about to embark on his path to infamy. In September of 1953, Blake resumed his work for SIS and was stationed at its offices at two Carlton Gardens. There he met SIS secretary Gillian Allen, whom he soon started dating. Despite the couple falling in love, George was reluctant to marry, knowing that the path he had chosen would eventually drag her down a dark, complicated path. Nevertheless, Gillian persisted with George, with the result that they were married in September 1954. The couple went on to have three children together, all boys named Anthony, James and Patrick. Within a month of his return to England, Blake met with KGB agent Sergei Kondrashev. He was a rising young intelligence officer dispatched by the KGB with the sole responsibility of running Moscow's mole inside MI6. Kondrashev was a recent addition to the KGB's Foreign Intelligence Directorate, which meant that his photograph was not yet in MI5's file of known Soviet spies. The initial meeting between the spy and his handler was a chance for the two to get acquainted and to discuss logistics, including Blake's need for a camera to photograph classified documents. Kondrashev promptly supplied the necessary equipment, and Blake began funneling a treasure trove of top-secret MI6 material to the KGB. Blake later became known as the Lunchtime Spy, taking the opportunity when his colleagues were out for lunch to photograph classified materials. He was meticulous in his methods, using a Minox camera to capture about 200 exposures a month of documents he had legitimate access to in the course of his employment, thereby avoiding suspicion. Blake unveiled intricate details about Western espionage methods and intelligence structures. He compromised many operations and forced a complete overhaul of British intelligence procedures after his betrayal was discovered. Once secure in their covert identities, undercover agents were exposed by Blake, leading to ruined careers, arrests and, in many cases, executions behind the Iron Curtain. In April 1955, George Blake received a new posting to Berlin, the very front line of the ideological battleground of the Cold War. Moving his family to Germany, he was based in the SIS offices attached to Hitler's Olympic Stadium. Ironically, he was tasked with recruiting Soviet double agents. 
It was while stationed in Berlin that Blake made perhaps his most significant betrayal, being the exposure of Operation Gold, a joint British and American surveillance program. This top-secret initiative saw the Allies constructing what became known as the Berlin Tunnel to tap into Soviet communication lines in Germany. This joint venture between the CIA and MI6 aimed to intercept the Soviets' shift from radio to landline communications. The Soviets had relocated their most secure communications underground in Berlin, and the Allies sought to tap into these lines as a means of gaining an early insight into Soviet intentions in Europe. The tunnel's construction was a significant engineering challenge, not least because of its length, 1,476 feet, slightly longer than the height of the Empire State Building. The operation was ambitious and costly, with a final bill exceeding $6.5 million. How Blake managed to compromise the operation was really quite simple. He happened to be the secretary at the meeting where the operation was initially planned, and he made an extra copy of the minutes and a sketch of the tunnel, which he promptly handed over to Kondrashev. The West's grand spying operation was compromised from the very beginning. The KGB, however, faced a dilemma. Ending Operation Gold too early would have risked compromising one of their most valuable double agents. Knowledge of the operation was restricted to only a few select KGB leaders, and for the time being chose to do nothing. Evidently, George Blake's value as an agent in place was worth more to the KGB than the harm they anticipated suffering as a result of Western spying. The KGB chose to bide their time until April 1956, when the tunnel was discovered in a staged event for the press. This proved of huge propaganda value to the Soviets, describing what the US and British had done as a breach of the norms of international law and a gangster act. Notwithstanding the Berlin Tunnel having been shut down after just 11 months, processing centers in London and Washington continued transcribing the hundreds of thousands of intercepted communications until September 1958. Blake managed to avoid suspicion following the Soviets' fortuitous chance discovery and for the next four years continued to systematically leak every significant secret that came his way. Blake's success as a double agent in Berlin was so significant that KGB files later smuggled out of Russia recorded that Blake had effectively neutralized Western intelligence in East Germany. As quickly as MI6 could recruit agents, they were compromised by Blake and rounded up by the KGB and either imprisoned or executed. But all good spy games must eventually come to an end, and as is so often the case, Blake's run would eventually be brought to an end by a betrayal from within. In the early months of 1958, the American envoy in Bern, Switzerland, was handed a perplexing letter. Within its folds was another sealed note, specifically addressed to the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. Penned in German, the letter bore the signature Heckenschutzer, translating to Sniper. Instead of reaching Hoover, the message found its way to the CIA. As weeks turned into months, the anonymous informant began revealing Soviet secrets to US officials. The prevailing theory was that this covert informant was a high-ranking official in the Polish intelligence community, potentially with ties to the KGB. While initial skepticism surrounded such unsolicited informants as being potential Soviet plants, it quickly became evident that Sniper's intel was authentic. Sniper was later revealed to be Michael Golanewski, who, at the time of his first contact with the US, was the deputy head of Polish military counterintelligence. Among his startling disclosures was the very real possibility that there was a mole operating within MI6. Agent Sniper had provided the CIA with a list of seven Soviet spies working in the US, Britain and Israel, and a list of 26 Polish officials targeted for possible recruitment as agents. It was deduced by the CIA that these lists must have been obtained by the KGB from a mole in Britain's secret service. MI6 denied this, saying that it was more likely that the KGB got their hands on the document after the burglary of a safe in one of its offices in Brussels. The denial notwithstanding, MI6 embarked on an investigation of ten men who had access to the document, including Blake. All ten were exonerated. MI6 had to admit that they probably had a mole, but they had no idea who it was. By the time that Blake left his posting in Berlin and returned to London in May 1959, he was most likely still under suspicion. 
Nevertheless, he continued to funnel critical intelligence to his KGB handler for the next year. In September 1960, MI6 discreetly removed Blake from active duty, sending him to the Middle East Center in Beirut under the guise of learning Arabic. Although Agent Sniper never explicitly named Blake, the trail of breadcrumbs eventually led investigators to the foot of his door. Golanevsky defected to America along with his mistress in January 1961. His testimony, along with the information contained in the letters he had already sent, was the linchpin that unmasked Blake as a double agent. Had British intelligence scratched a little deeper during their initial investigation, they could have possibly stemmed the flow of information to the Soviets much sooner and saved the lives of some of their compromised agents. Nevertheless, British intelligence had to look forwards and began meticulously gathering evidence for what would be a crucial interrogation of their prime suspect. As the net tightened around Blake, and with Golanevsky safely tucked away in a CIA safe house following his defection, Blake was recalled to London on the 3rd of April 1961. Although Blake was told that the purpose of his trip to London was to have a routine interview relating to his next assignment, Blake was worried. Before leaving Beirut, he met one last time with his Soviet handler on a deserted beach. He was told not to worry, that London didn't suspect a thing. Putting his trust in the KGB's intelligence, he departed for England, leaving behind his pregnant wife and two sons. Upon arrival at the SIS's personnel department in St. James's Park, Blake knew the game was up. He was met by a stern panel of MI6 agents and over the next 48 hours was subjected to an intense interrogation. He was bombarded with evidence of his spying activities and questioned relentlessly. Despite the mounting evidence, Blake staunchly denied it all, remaining cool under pressure. It seemed that against the odds he had gained the upper hand in the interrogation. However, as the hours of interrogation dragged on, Blake began to be worn down. He finally broke when CIA agents suggested to Blake that he had been tortured while a prisoner in North Korea and forced into becoming a spy. Blake immediately denied this. His knee-jerk response was to say that his decision to work with the Soviets had been entirely his own. With those words, Blake had sealed his fate. Confronted with undeniable proof and the realization that his cover was then well and truly blown, Blake's resistance crumbled. He began to cooperate with the CIA and MI6 investigators, revealing the depths and details of his betrayal with startling candor. The confirmation of MI6's worst fears sent shockwaves through the organization and in the Western intelligence community at large. The idea that they could be betrayed by one of their own, a man who had endured years of captivity for his country, was almost inconceivable. Blake revealed that he had disclosed to his KGB handler the entire breakdown of MI6's personnel, the location of all its safe houses, its order of battle, and its outstations across the globe. A later assessment of the damage caused by Blake to Western intelligence was seen as being much worse than Philby. According to Blake's own admissions, he had compromised nearly 400 Western agents operating covertly behind the Iron Curtain. While he had caused untold damage to Great Britain, the game was finally over and it was time for George Blake to face a jury of his peers. In May 1961, George Blake stood trial at the Old Bailey for his espionage crimes. Under the Official Secrets Act 1911, the maximum sentence for a single offence was 14 years. However, Blake's actions were split into five distinct periods, leading to five separate charges. On the 3rd of May 1961, Blake entered guilty pleas for each of the charges. Much of the trial was conducted in closed session, ostensibly to protect British intelligence secrets, but more likely to shield the government from further embarrassment. The Lord Chief Justice, Lord Parker of Waddington, handed down the maximum possible sentence, 14 years for each of three counts of spying consecutively and 14 years for the remaining two counts concurrently. This totaled a staggering 42-year imprisonment and is one of the longest non-life terms ever issued by a British court. Blake expressed his astonishment at receiving such a harsh sentence given that he had cooperated fully with the authorities and had entered guilty pleas. The harsh sentence was not enough to quell the questions lingering in the air about the integrity of the intelligence community. In the wake of the trial, 
Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, who had already been embarrassed by other failings of what he referred to as the so-called secret service, attempted to downplay the severity of Blake's betrayals to Parliament. Macmillan asserted that while Blake had indeed harmed the nation's interests, the damage was not irreparable. However, the reality was far grimmer. While Blake maintained that none of the agents he compromised faced any physical harm, MI6's assessments painted a different picture. It was estimated that at least 40 of the approximately 400 operatives compromised by Blake met an untimely end at the hands of the KGB. The CIA recognised the Blake case for what it was, a profound and detrimental breach of Allied intelligence efforts against the Soviets. The trial's aftermath continued to reverberate in the months and years that followed. Macmillan's attempts to downplay the damage were met with public scepticism, and the subsequent exposure of other spies and scandals further eroded public trust. The Blake case, combined with other intelligence failures, would eventually contribute to Macmillan's resignation in 1963. Locked away in Wormwood Scrubs prison, Blake might have faded into obscurity as being just another traitor who got what he deserved. After his wife Gillian learned of her husband's betrayal, she continued in the marriage, visiting him while he was in prison. However, during a visit in 1966, Gillian broke the news to George that she had met another man and wanted to file for divorce. Serving effectively what was a life sentence and with his family falling apart, George Blake had nothing left to lose. But he was not yet done making headlines. Wormwood Scrubs, a Victorian-era prison with its imposing brick walls and watchtowers, was designed to be inescapable. But for George Blake, it became the setting for one of the most notorious prison breaks in British history. In 1961, Blake entered this fortress, a place where even the name inspired sympathy for its inmates. Inside, Blake was not a solitary figure. He made connections, notably with Sean Bourke, an Irish anti-establishment figure, and two other inmates, Pat Pottle and Michael Randall. Sean Bourke was serving a sentence of seven years for sending a bomb in a biscuit tin to a policeman. While the bomb detonated, the policemen survived. Pottle and Randall were anti-nuclear campaigners serving short stints for non-violent offences committed in the course of their peace missions. The men soon got to talking, and before long, they began to hatch the beginnings of a plan to spring Blake from the prison after the others had been released. As soon as the three men had served their sentences, they got to work on the outside. Bork smuggled in a two-way radio which was used to communicate with Blake and coordinate the escape. Pottle and Randall assisted in the escape plans by raising funds to purchase a getaway vehicle and to rent a London flat where Blake would hide from the authorities once he had made his escape. Eventually, the date for the escape was set for the evening of the 22nd of October 1966. After serving five years of his 42-year sentence, George Blake was going to make a break for his freedom. The plan was simple. Blake would slip away while the other inmates and guards were engrossed in the showing of a movie and would scale the prison wall with the assistance of Bourke, who was to throw over a rope ladder. On this rainy evening, Blake, shielded by blankets draped over a stairwell railing, managed to squeeze through a small gap between the iron bars of a window that had been purposely broken by another inmate. He then carefully navigated the slippery roof tiles and made his way to the edge. With agility, he grabbed the gutter and descended to the ground, pressing himself against the prison building. In the dim light of the prison yard's arc lamps, after what felt like an eternity, he finally saw the ladder being thrown over the wall. It looked incredibly thin and fragile, but the moment I saw it, I knew nothing now would stop me, Blake later recalled. Blake successfully scaled the wall, although he fractured his wrist and was knocked momentarily unconscious after jumping from the ladder as he lowered himself to the ground. Bork bundled Blake into the getaway car, and the duo then sped away into the night. However, their getaway was not without its hitches. In their haste to flee the scene, Bork collided with another vehicle that had stopped for pedestrians. Despite the onlookers' startled stares, they managed to continue on, reaching their hideout within a few minutes. When Blake's absence from Wormwood Scrubs was finally noticed, it triggered one of the largest manhunts in British history. Officers scoured airports and embassies. False rumours circulated that Blake was going to be smuggled out of the country by hiding in a harp case belonging to the Czechoslovakian State Orchestra. In the weeks that followed Blake's daring escape, 
reports of Blake sightings came from all corners of the globe. Following a tip-off, Australian authorities surrounded a plane that landed in Sydney, inspecting passengers for any sign of disguise, but Blake was not found. While all this was going on, Blake remained hidden in London, moving from one safe house to another. Blake and Bourke were considering various options to smuggle him to Russia, including dyeing his skin brown as a form of disguise or tossing him over the wall of the Soviet embassy in London. After much deliberation, Blake and Bourke decided on smuggling him out in a secret compartment of a camper van. On the night of December 17, 1966, and with George Blake stowed away in the hidden compartment, Michael Randall, his wife Anne and their children set out, aiming to cross borders under the pretense of travelling for a holiday in continental Europe. En route to Dover to catch the English Channel Crossing ferry, they were alarmed by Blake making banging noises from within his hideaway. He had a hot water bottle with him, but in the confined space the pungent smell of warm rubber was causing him to retch from nausea. After discarding the bottle, they only just made it to the ferry before its midnight departure. The vehicle was waved aboard without inspection. After making the crossing, Randall and his wife drove continuously through Belgium and into West Germany, not stopping until they reached the East German helmstedt marienborn border crossing. Near Berlin, Blake was left in a wooded area near an East German checkpoint. An army officer, surprised by Blake's claim to be an Englishman, contacted the KGB. Blake's handler soon arrived on the scene and whisked him away for an initial debriefing. George Blake's gamble for his freedom had paid off. He had managed to evade the scores of British police searching for him and was soon aboard a plane destined for Moscow. The escape was a major embarrassment for liberal-minded British Home Secretary Roy Jenkins. Blake was just one in a series of high-profile prison escapes, with great train robbery prisoners Charlie Wilson and Ronnie Biggs flying the coop of the British prison system soon after in 1964 and 1965, respectively. After serving only five years of his 42-year sentence, Blake was once again a free man. The British government was left red-faced. Not only had one of the most notorious traitors escaped from a maximum security prison, but he had also managed to flee to the very heart of the enemy's territory. In the heart of Moscow, George Blake found a new beginning. Moscow became his sanctuary, a place where he could live without looking over his shoulder, but also a golden cage from which there was no return. The Soviet Union welcomed him not as a traitor, but as a hero. But the personal toll of his actions was evident. The separation from his three children was a wound that would take years to heal. In 1990, he penned his autobiography, No Other Choice, detailing his journey and the choices he made. The book reflects his somewhat deterministic view of how his life played out, perhaps a remnant of his Calvinist beliefs. Throughout his time in Moscow, Blake's relationship with communism remained unwavering despite the later revelations of the true horrors of Stalinist communism. In interviews during the 1990s, he often spoke of it as a great experiment of mankind, a vision of a just society. Yet, the weight of his decisions lingered. While he naively believed that none of the agents he betrayed faced execution, all evidence suggests that no less than 40 of those agents were killed by the KGB or those doing their bidding. Amidst the political and personal turmoil, Blake found love again. In 1968, he married Ida Mikhailovna Karayeva, and the couple welcomed a child. Time also brought reconciliation with his children from his first marriage. As the years passed, honours came his way. In 2007, on his 85th birthday, Vladimir Putin awarded him the Order of Friendship. By 2012, Blake, now 90, lived in Moscow on a KGB pension in a spacious, rent-free apartment, Age had taken a toll on his eyesight, rendering him virtually blind. Yet his beliefs remained unchanged. He saw himself not as a British traitor, but as a committed Marxist-Leninist. His assertion, To betray, you first have to belong. I never belonged, encapsulated his lifelong belief. While he was both a British and a Dutch citizen, and was fond of both peoples and cultures, he was at heart loyal only to his ideology. Addressing a press conference for Western journalists in Moscow in 1992, George Blake said, Those people who were betrayed were not innocent people. They were no better nor worse than I am. It's all part of the intelligence world, 
If the man who turned me in came to my house today, I'd invite him to sit down and have a cup of tea. As for Sean Bourke, he joined Blake in Moscow, where he lived for eighteen months. However, a life in Russia wasn't for him, and so he returned to Ireland. Despite the British government's requests, the Irish government refused to extradite Bourke, citing his part in Blake's escape as falling within the political offence exception to Ireland's extradition laws. Pat Pottle and Michael Randall were eventually prosecuted in 1991 for their role in aiding Blake in his prison escape. They too stood trial at the Old Bailey, raising as their defence that their actions were morally justified. Their motivation for helping Blake was the inhuman prison sentence imposed on him and the poor treatment he had received from the British judicial system. Although the judge in the case directed the jury to convict, this was ignored, and the two men were unanimously acquitted. The final chapter in the life of George Blake came on December 26, 2020. At the age of 98, the former MI6 officer and Soviet spy passed away in Moscow. His death marked the end of a life that spanned almost a century, filled with twists and turns that could rival any spy thriller. The Russian Foreign Intelligence Service hailed Blake as a brilliant professional of special courage and determination. President Vladimir Putin expressed his deep condolences, stating that Blake had made a valuable contribution to ensuring strategic parity during the Cold War and maintaining peace on the planet. In contrast, in the West, the British government's response was more muted. Blake's death reignited the debate about his legacy. To some, he was a traitor who had caused immeasurable harm to his country and the free world. To others, he was a man of conviction who stood by his beliefs even when they led him down a dangerous path. George Blake was buried in Moscow's Troyekurovskoye Cemetery, in the city that had been his home for more than half a century. The simple ceremony was attended by family, friends and former KGB colleagues. As the cold winter wind swept across the cemetery, there was a sense of an era coming to an end. Regardless of your view of George Blake and the decisions he made, he was a man who played the spy game and won.